Okay, Luke Acts for beginners. This is lesson number 25 in that series, Paul's arrest and imprisonment, part three of that particular section. We're going to cover Acts 25, 13 to 26, 32, Lord willing. In our last lesson, uh, Luke described uh, Paul's appearance before an outgoing and then an incoming uh, governor. Uh, he argued his case before Felix and was kept in prison for two years as a favor to the Jewish leadership. When Festus became governor, Paul also appealed before him and fearing an attack from the Jews, as well as more imprisonment time, he appealed his case to Caesar in Rome. So Festus permitted this, but before his departure, Paul would appear to make his case before yet another ruler, uh, this episode completes the third section of Paul's imprisonment before his transfer to Rome. And as you can see, we're getting close to the end of our lesson plan. So let's begin in uh, chapter 25, shall we? Verse 13, it says, Now when several days had elapsed, King Agrippa and Bernice arrived at Caesarea and paid their respects to Festus. So King Agrippa, um, ruled another province to the north um, with a similar name. That was the, for its capital city. That was the confusion here. There was uh, Caesarea uh, by the sea, and then there was Caesarea Philippi. So Caesarea by the sea, that was ruled by Festus, that province there, and Caesarea Philippi was ruled by Agrippa, and that was in the northern part. So you had two rulers ruling from cities with similar names. A Little bit about Agrippa II. Agrippa II was the last of Herod's descendants to rule as king. He grew up in Rome. He was trained in Roman ways in the court of the emperor Claudius. And even though he ruled a northern territory, he was the one who ruled up in Caesarea Philippi, further north, even though he ruled a northern territory, he was given charge over the affairs of the temple in Jerusalem and was responsible for appointing the high priest. In those days, the garments for the high priest were actually kept under lock and key by the governor. Even the priests didn't have access to you know, the garments. And so that high position in, in Jewish society uh, was uh, monitored and supervised by the Roman governor at that time. So because of um, his responsibility, you know, Agrippa, uh, his responsibility in naming the high priest and he was in charge of the temple, all that business, he was also trained in Jewish law and custom and religion. This may be one of the reasons Festus sought his opinion on Paul's case since it involved both the temple and Jewish religious matters, he figures, well, Agrippa is you know, well versed in these things. I'm going to bring him in. Now, uh, Luke mentions uh, Bernice, not our Bernice, but another Bernice. Bernice was Agrippa's sister. And uh, the rumor at the time was that these two carried on an incestuous relationship, as was the custom Agrippa and Bernice were visiting Festus, the new ruler, at his palace in Caesarea by the sea in order to you know, welcome him to his position. Um, an interesting note, a little historical thing there, um, is that the palace where Festus was situated was originally built by Agrippa and Bernice's grandfather, Herod the Great, and they as children had played together in this particular, uh, in this particular uh, you know, building. And so we move to Acts chapter 25, and there you see you know, a rendering, the drawing, a rendering, and then you see an actual picture of the site uh, today, as it, as it seems today. All right, Acts 25, verse 14. While they were spending many days there, uh, Festus laid Paul's case before the king, saying, there is a man who was left as a prisoner by Felix, and when I was at Jerusalem, the chief priests and the elders of the Jews brought charges against him, asking for a sentence of condemnation uh, against him. 
I answered them that it was not the custom of the Romans to hand over any man before the accused meets his accusers face to face and has an opportunity to make his defense against the charges. So after they had assembled here, I did not delay, but on the next day took my seat on the tribunal and ordered the man to be brought before me. When the accusers stood up, they began bringing charges against him, not of such crimes as I was expecting, but they simply had some points of disagreement with him about their own religion and about a dead man, Jesus, whom Paul asserted to be alive. Being at a loss how to investigate such matters, I asked whether he was willing to go to Jerusalem and there stand trial on these matters. But when Paul appealed to be held in custody for the emperor's decision, I ordered him to be kept in custody until I sent him to Caesar. Then Agrippa said to Festus, I also would like to hear the man myself. Tomorrow, he said, you shall hear him. A couple of things to note about Festus' account of Paul's case and the trials. First of all, he says that Paul was left in prison as if he was serving time for some kind of crime, when in reality he was denied his legal right to freedom by both Philip and Festus in order to curry favor with the Jewish leaders. You know, it's what's being left out that is really telling here. Another thing, he explains that he quickly held a hearing to determine his case but was at a loss since the charges were for religious violations and disagreements not usually pursued in Roman courts. He actually admits this, okay? So what he doesn't say is that those accusing him could not even provide any proof for these religious crimes. And instead of dismissing the case as one not legally binding in a Roman court, he chose to keep Paul in prison with the hope of receiving a bribe in order to set him free. Again, some of the information not provided. And then of course, yeah. And then of course, let me get one more, there we go. And then of course, Festus tells Agrippa that he offered Paul a choice, to go stand trial in Jerusalem or to stay in prison in the palace at Caesarea. Again, what he neglects to mention, and that was, a, and that was there was a third option. And that was to set Paul free because his accusers had no evidence whatsoever that Paul had violated any Jewish or even Roman laws for that matter. He could have set him free. So Paul's request to appeal to Caesar directly actually put Festus in a difficult position politically since his mismanagement of this case would make him look bad not only with the Jewish leaders who would lose their opportunity to kill Paul but also to his superiors in Rome who had just appointed him to this new position. So he comes into this new position and he kind of fumbles the ball. The very first case that he gets as governor, he fumbles the ball. So his effort to bring Agrippa into the picture may have been an attempt to find a way out or to curry favor with a local ruler, and here's the important part, with a local ruler who was highly regarded by the emperor. Agrippa, remember we said, was trained, was part of the court at, um, at uh, Claudius's court. So he had, you know, he had a little bit of power, Agrippa, you know, at headquarters. And so Festus draws him into the case in order to kind of spread the blame a little bit. All right, so let's uh, take a look at uh, Festus presenting uh, Paul's case. Uh, chapter 25, uh, verse uh, 23. Luke writes, so on the next day when Agrippa came together with Bernice amid great pomp and entered the auditorium accompanied by the commanders and the prominent men of the city, at the command of Festus, Paul was brought in. Festus said, King Agrippa and all you gentlemen here present with us, you see this man about whom all the people of the Jews appealed to me, both at Jerusalem and here, loudly declaring that he ought not to live any longer. But I found that he had committed nothing worthy of death. And since he himself appealed to the emperor, I decided to send him. Yet I have nothing definite about him to write to my Lord. Therefore, I have brought him before you all, and especially before you, King Agrippa, so that after the investigation has taken place, I may have something to write for it seems absurd to me in sending a prisoner not to indicate also the charges against him. 
So Festus' short speech before Agrippa and the assembled guests, you know, this is a master class in political dissembling. I mean, this guy could go to Washington tomorrow. <laughs> he would fit in very well with some there. In other words, Festus has orchestrated this event to cover over the failure, his failure, in providing Paul with basic Roman justice. Note how he has done this. First, he's created an event with important guests and Agrippa and Bernice as the center of attention. And he's spread the responsibility for what happens to Paul from only himself now to include Agrippa, who will now share in the decision and in the outcome. Because he says, you know, I'm just going to go by your decision. So you can imagine what his report is going to be when he sends it with Paul. Secondly, he omits the fact that after having heard the accusations of the Jews and Paul's defense, he failed to render a verdict. And this is why Paul is still in prison and was forced to appeal to Caesar. All of that was not necessary. And then thirdly, by proclaiming his ignorance of Jewish religious customs, which was not necessary to judge the case and render a verdict, he didn't have to know about Jew Jewish customs to render the case from the point of view of Jew Jew uh, Roman law. According to Roman law, he had to set Paul free. It was an open and shut case. But now he appeals to Agrippa's knowledge of some, such things in order to prepare a formal charge. He has included Agrippa's name and prestige in this matter. Now he may not be off the hook with the Jewish leaders, but right now he is more concerned with protecting himself politically from a misstep very early in his term as a governor over the Judean province. So now Luke describes or tells us about the defense that Paul mounts. Agrippa said to Paul, you are permitted to speak for yourself. Then Paul stretched out his hand and proceeded to make his defense. In regard to all the things of which I am accused by the Jews, I consider myself fortunate, King Agrippa, that I am about to make my defense before you today, especially because you are an expert in all customs and questions among the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to listen uh, to me patiently. Again, Paul's reference to the king is brief, it's respectful without being overly flowery or burdened by hypocritical flattery. Being a Roman citizen, he's aware of what is going on in the empire politically. Therefore, he knows who Agrippa is and how he was prepared for the role of governor and overseer of the temple. We keep reading. So then all Jews know my manner of life from my youth up, which from the beginning was spent among my own nation and at Jerusalem since they have known about me for a long time, if they are willing to testify that I lived as a Pharisee according to the strictest sect of our religion. And now I am standing trial for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers, the promise to which our 12 tribes hope to attain as they earnestly serve God night and day. And for this hope, O King, I am being accused by the Jews. Why is it considered incredible among you people if God does raise the dead? So Paul summarizes the results of the three appearances he has had before the Jews, Felix and Festus. That the Jews were familiar with him as he lived among them as a Pharisee, a highly respected position in that society. He also mentions their absence of testimony concerning his past life and by extension their lack of evidence concerning the crimes that he may have committed. And then he declares what the basis of their anger with him and religious disagreement is all about, the promise of bodily resurrection to those who are faithful to Jesus Christ. He said, that, this is what this is all about, he says. The resurrection from the dead, something that all Jews have been promised. So he's even covering the Jewish side you know, in, in, in saying, I don't even know why they're, uh, what they're angry about. God has promised bodily resurrection. Every, all Jews know that. So Agrippa, having been you know, schooled in these matters of Jewish law, custom and teachings, 
knew about the division between the Pharisees and the Sadducees over this issue. We've talked about that in the past, right? The Sadducees, the priests, they only accepted the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, as authoritative, as inspired. Everything else, the prophets, everything else, they didn't accept those. They didn't believe in the afterlife. You know, only this life here and then there's nothing. That's what they believed. The Pharisees, on the other hand, they, you know, the entire Old Testament canon, they accepted that. And the prophets and spirits and life after death. So that's what he's talking about, this debate between these two, these two groups. Paul's point is that this is a disagreement over religious issues, not a crime worthy of death for either a Jewish or a Roman court. He even pleads his case for belief in the resurrection by stating that resurrecting man from the dead is not impossible for God if he chose to do this, and not beyond the ability of man to believe that God is capable of this. It's so logical, his argument. Even for somebody who is not a Jew, who doesn't believe, he's saying, he's saying to the king, is it so fantastic that God could raise a man from the dead, that God would have the power to do that? And is it so fantastic that a person would believe that God has the power to do that for them personally? You know? His point is, I'm being you know, charged with death because I believe this and I'm promoting this. So we keep going, verse nine. So then I thought to myself that I had to do many things hostile to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And this is just what I did in Jerusalem. Not only did I lock up many of the saints in prisons, having received authority from the chief priests, but also when they were being put to death, I cast my vote against them. And as I punished them often in all the synagogues, I tried to force them to blaspheme. And being furiously enraged at them, I kept pursuing them, even to foreign cities. So at this point, Paul begins to tell his personal story. Now that he's dealt with the, you know, the accusations against him and the fact that there's, there's no legal merit in the accusations against him, he briefly details his initial attacks against Christianity and the church as a zealous Pharisee, duly charged by the religious leaders, the same leaders who want to put him to death now, so he was charged by these people to destroy Christianity itself and its followers in the most vicious ways. When you think about, you know, when Paul says, I, the chief sinner, you know, his sins, he's listing them here. He put them in jail. He promoted their executions. He attacked them. He rooted them out of the local synagogues. He forced them to curse and deny Christ. He hunted them down from city to city. Those are, pretty serious, those are pretty serious sins. Imagine killing, murdering a Christian because of his belief. I don't think God you know, looks too kindly on that. That's a pretty serious sin. I mean, you rob a man and while you're robbing him, you kill him. Well, that's a serious sin. But you kill a man only because he believes? Or you kill a man because he believes specifically in Jesus? I wouldn't want to be in your shoes at the judgment. So Paul says, this was who I was. Keep going, verse 12. While so engaged as I was journeying to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests, at midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining all around me and those who were journeying um, with me. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew dialect, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goats. And I said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and stand on your feet. For this purpose I have appeared to you, to appoint you a minister and a witness, not only to the things which you have seen, but also to the things in which I will appear to you rescuing you from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. So this is Paul's own personal account of Jesus' appearance to him 
as told and recorded by Luke. The event as follows, a powerful light appears to him and those with him as they are journeying to Damascus in order to carry on his persecution against the Christians. All of this authorized by the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem. Note that all of them were affected by the light since they all fell to the ground when seeing it. However, only Paul hears the voice of the Lord. Now there's a lot of discussion surrounding the meaning of Jesus' statement concerning Saul. You know, in verse 14, it is hard for you to kick against the goads. This refers to a situation where a farmer plowing a field with a team of oxen would prod the animals with a stick or a goad so as to make them move faster or stay in the furrow, stay in line. Often when the animals were goaded in this way, they would kick back. But in doing so, they would only hit and harp themselves as a result. So in today's vernacular, we would convey the, this idea with the expression, why are you beating your head against the wall? That's what that means. So Jesus was revealing two things to Paul here. One, he could not win this battle against these Christians. This was a losing battle on his, on his side. And two, he would only be hurting himself in the process. So it's not mentioned here, but Paul's tactics and character uh, was even violating his own faith and how uh, and law as a devout Jew. I mean, Judaism did not condone him going and killing you know, Christians and doing violence against them. So he knows by the light and by the voice that he hears that he is in the presence of a heavenly being. He doesn't know yet what to do or who it is. And so Jesus identifies himself and he goes on to inform Paul concerning his future service. He will become a minister in the case, and in this case, a servant directly appointed to carry out Jesus' instructions. He will be a witness of the risen Christ because it is the risen Jesus who now speaks to him. And he will be a witness to the fact that Jesus has risen from the dead, appointed to this task by Jesus himself, as were the other apostles, and thus this is his calling as an apostle. Also, like the other apostles, Jesus tells him that he's going to provide him further instructions and revelations in the future. Finally, the Lord lays out the scope of his ministry, which will include ministry to both Jews and Gentiles in preaching the gospel, and through this, free people from ignorance of the true God and grant them forgiveness of sins and eternal life in heaven. This is the inheritance given to faithful Christians. When they say the inheritance, they're talking about uh, heaven, eternal life. So uh, Jesus summarizes what Paul will receive and eventually begin to do, but it will take many years before all these three things are fully realized in his life. And so we continue reading. Now usually I summarize a lot of this for you. Remember I, I tell you to read ahead, but uh, you know, better to let Paul summarize his own life than you know, I summarize it. So we read in verse 19, so King Agrippa, I did not prove disobedient to the heavenly vision, but kept declaring both to those of Damascus first and also at Jerusalem and then throughout all the region of Judea and even to the Gentiles that they should repent and return to God, performing deeds appropriate to repentance. For this reason, some Jews seized me in the temple and tried to put me to death. So having obtained help from God, I stand to this day testifying both to small and great stating nothing but what the prophets and Moses said was going to take place, that the Christ was to suffer, and that by reason of his resurrection from the dead, he would be the first to proclaim light, both to the Jewish people and uh, uh, to the uh, Gentiles. So Paul continues by kind of fast forwarding from the day of his encounter with Jesus to his fully matured ministry of preaching and teaching the gospel to Jews living in Jerusalem and the region, as well as the Gentiles throughout the Roman Empire. 
So it's in this context of this preaching and witnessing ministry that he was in Jerusalem. He wasn't there to make trouble, he says. He wasn't there to desecrate the temple or to break Roman law. He was there, he says, to urge people to repent and believe that Jesus was the Messiah according to the law and prophets, he says. That's, that's why I was there. And so he finishes by bringing his story into the present moment as he stands before the, the high officials and prominent citizens and he urges them to believe in the risen Christ. And at this point, right in the middle of this, he's interrupted by Festus. Very interesting. While Paul was saying this, you know, Paul's in full flight here. He's right in the middle of his sermon, so to speak. While Paul was saying this in his defense, Festus said in a loud voice, interesting, Paul, you're out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you mad. But Paul said, I am not out of my mind, most excellent Festus, but I utter words of truth. For the king knows about these matters and I speak to him also with confidence since I am persuaded that none of these things escaped his notice. For this has not been done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you do. Agrippa replied to Paul, in a short time you will persuade me to become a Christian. And Paul said, I would wish to God that whether in a short or long time, not only you, but also all who hear me this day might become such as I am, except for these chains. I would say that's a pretty successful sermon so far. You know, Festus is either feeling the heat of the gospel message personally, or he is afraid and he is afraid that Paul's bold and direct speech might offend some of his guests, especially Agrippa, whose approval and support he needs in this matter. So what does he do? He decides to interrupt. Boy, you know, it's like you know, your uncle who has a little too much, uh, uh, not, what we, eggnog, yeah, your uncle who has too much eggnog and is starting to talk too loud and yeah, I remember, yeah, to starting to tell his war stories, you know, and, and your wife says, well, Uncle Joe, isn't it time we went and had a little bit of, you know, you know that? this is exactly what happened here. <laughs> Festus said, Paul, Paul, you know, whoa, easy boy. He's got all his people there, his nobles and you know, military people, the, the king, the guy who's got some torque up at the, you know, at the emperor's palace. Paul then amazingly answers Festus' charge by reminding him that the king knows about Jesus and his teachings and the cross and the eyewitness reports of his resurrection and the subsequent growth of the church. He's saying, boy, you know what's going on. You, you've seen, you've heard of the resurrection. You've seen the church grow. The point made but not spoken is that Festus along with everyone else there are accountable to the gospel and subject to God's judgment in failing to respond. That's what Festus is nervous about. Basically Paul tells him that he, Festus, will not be able to plead ignorance at judgment because that's where he's going. He, had, he, he wasn't able to finish his sermon yet. He didn't get to the part where it says, repent you know, or you'll perish. He didn't get to that part yet. But Festus knew what was coming. What is truly amazing in this situation is that Paul, having dealt with one king, now goes after the other king, Agrippa. And he challenges the king by asking him outright concerning his faith in the prophets and in the writings concerning the coming of the Messiah who he has just stated was Jesus, the risen Savior. It's almost like he's finished with Festus and then he says, yeah, what about you, Agrippa? <laughs> I know that you know this. I know you believe in the prophet. You know, I know your training. I know you know all of this. Where, where do you stand? Wow. His point is that if he answers yes, I believe the prophets, then that will be the first step in leading to his eventual conversion. Paul, seeing the king's hesitation to continue, extends the invitation to everybody. You know, he goes from Festus to Agrippa to everybody in the room. He has no fear whatsoever. 
His final reference to his chains is a reminder to both of the kings that he is being held as a prisoner for proclaiming the message that they have just heard, which is clearly not a breach of either Jewish law or Roman law. He may be bearing the chains and imprisonment, but these two kings are bearing the guilt. And so we see Agrippa's response. The king stood up. When the king stands up, you know what that means, eh? That means this meeting is over. <laughs> so the king stands up and the governor and Bernice and those who were sitting with them and when they had gone aside, they began talking to one another saying, this man is not doing anything worthy of death or imprisonment. And Agrippa said to Festus, this man might have been set free if he had not appealed uh, to Caesar. So Agrippa confirms what Paul had claimed and Festus had concluded that Paul was not guilty of any crime. But saying this, Agrippa puts the case back into Festus' hands, leaving him to send Paul to Rome without criminal charges. He just, yeah, you're right. He's not guilty of any crime. Go ahead, do what you need to do. <laughs> He could not free Paul now because Paul made an official appeal in open court which could not be changed. That was part of the Roman law. So this sets the scene for the final event recorded by Luke and that is Paul's voyage to Rome and the, you know, the things that happened that'll be in our last lesson uh, next time. So a couple of, uh, couple of just object lessons if you wish. God's timetable is not our timetable. Paul spent over two years in prison. We gloss over that, but two years is a long, long time. Have you ever waited for news like you maybe you've, you put in for a job or a transfer or some sort of promotion? They say, yeah, yeah, we're going to get back to you. How long do you feel time goes by while you're waiting for that phone call? Can you imagine not having committed any crime whatsoever and sitting in jail, not for two days or two months, two years? That's a long time. And think, Paul was in his prime. He was in the prime of his ministry. The churches needed him and there was no one else of his stature that was effectively bringing the gospel to the Gentiles. There is no other story or event recorded by Luke that would somehow explain or make up for the lost time and the work that could have been done during that period. Can you imagine Paul's prayers? Lord, Lord, all those churches that have been established that are, you know, that are struggling, they need me. I need to be out there. You know, coach, put me in. <laughs> coach, we're losing. Put me in the game. The only thing that helped Paul bear the frustration and the discomfort and the perceived loss of time and opportunity was the knowledge that God was fully aware of Paul's circumstances and the time of his imprisonment. When we are assured that God has his timetable for things and it is rarely, you know, it rarely matches our own timetable then we can find peace and acceptance in times of illness or failure, but especially times of delay where the only thing we can do is wait. You know, I'm, I, I broke my leg, the doctor said two weeks in a cast, I'm, it's two months now and it still hurts and I can't put my weight on it, what's going on? That's your timetable. When you say to your children, when are you going to grow up? That's your timetable. God, when is this going to happen? That's your timetable. Lord, haven't I suffered enough? That's your timetable. We need to understand that our timetable is not His timetable. When we finally accept that, then we can accept our situation. It doesn't mean we do nothing, it doesn't mean we don't try to improve and you know, whatever. But we're all, if we're believers, then we are all under His timetable. And we need to resolve that once and for all in our minds. Lesson number two, your own story is your best witness for Christ. 
Notice that Paul did not address these educated people with theological arguments or a long list of scriptures and their careful explanation, which he could have done. He simply told his story. His conversion was familiar. It was sincere, it was powerful because it detailed the changes that took place in his life because of Christ. You know, not everybody can teach a class. Not everybody can you know, debate the Bible or you know, debate doctrine with somebody else of another viewpoint or another religion. However, everyone has a story about their conversion. Everyone has a story about their growth in Christ or some, some prayer that perhaps God has answered or some experience that we've had as Christians. So your story is the very best witness because it is true. It is familiar to you, it's powerful, and it can be repeated many times without losing its effect to impact people for Christ. So I say to you, when you're in doubt, when you're brought forth to witness somehow, begin by telling your story. That's your best witness, your story. And your story has impact. Your story has meaning to you and you're the best person to tell your story. Okay, final assignment, Acts 27, 1, 28, 31. We should round it out next time we're together for class. All right, that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. I appreciate it.